join me in your Bibles. If you take your Bibles, please turn with me this morning. We're going to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. And we're going to go to the 11th chapter. It's called the faith chapter. Many know it as the faith chapter. Hebrews, we're going to be going again to the 11th chapter. We're going to be picking that up in just a moment. Have you ever been talking to someone and wondered if they were listening? I said, have you ever been talking to someone? <laughs> Former United States president, who himself often had to endure these long, arduous receiving lines where people make these complimentary statements to one another, but really nobody's listening to the other. And he began to complain that he just detested these long lineups as a president. People rolling by, shaking hands, saying things. They're not listening, he said. They're not listening. They're not paying attention. So one day he decided to try an experiment. During a receiving line, as each person came down the line, this is the United States president. As each person came down the line and shook his hand, he murmured with a smile. He murmured, I murdered my grandmother this morning. The guests responded in phrases like, marvelous, keep up the good work, we're proud of you, God bless America, God bless you, sir. Those were the responses. One by one, they came, he says, I murdered my grandmother this morning. God bless you, sir. And it was proving his point until the ambassador from Bolivia came by, and he actually heard what the president said. Unfazed, though, the ambassador, after the president said, I murdered my grandmother this morning, unfazed, the ambassador leaned in and whispered, I'm sure she had it coming, sir. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to pick it up in verse 38. Hebrews eleven thirty-eight. 38. This is the faith chapter, all those who were heroes of the faith of the Old Testament. 38, they wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. 39, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us, would they be made perfect? I'm going to read those three verses again. They're great three verses. Mark them in your Bibles if you would. They wander. These are, these are men and women of faith, heroes of the faith. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God, no, there's, that sentence continues. Since God, why didn't it receive what was promised? There's a reason. Since God had planned something. See that? They didn't receive in their day the promise. We saw that happen afterward. They didn't receive in their day the promise. They lived in horrible conditions. They went through the desert wanderings, not receiving the things that they saw by faith, but they didn't actually see them with their physical eyes or experience them in this world. It says, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something. Note the next word, better. God had something better. And then it switches from them to us. Note the, the change. Since God had something better for us, so what they endured, we get to experience the better. Since God had something planned, God planned something better for us, so that only together, linked the lines together with us, would they be made perfect. You say they could not be perfect if their story ended with them. Their story didn't end with them. Their story continues on in me today. Because of their faith, their story affected me today. Last night in our, our uh, prayer Zoom, I closed, I don't plan to do this in the future, 
have done in the past, but I took this scripture and I asked everybody in the prayer Zoom last night to meditate on those words of verse 40. Uh, I still, even as I, I'm even talking here today and I've meditated on it much, I'm realizing I'm probably only getting a part of it. They didn't receive what was promised since God had planned something. Listen, God's plans are above our plans. He's beyond my plan. So even when I think I got it, I'm going to be kind of realizing, shoot, I think I've only got part of it again. It's kind of like when you're putting a puzzle together and you put these together and you realize, well, there's still so much more that he is wanting to show you since God has planned something better for us. The title of what I want to share this morning is When God is Silent. When God is Silent. You call on him, you seek his face, you pursue him, and you're met with silence. Now, don't put your hands up, but does anybody relate? I'm going to suggest all our hands would go up if you relate to the silence of God. When we call on him and yet we're met with silence, and so my message, when God is silent, let's ask that he would not be silent to our hearts in the next few minutes. Can we do that? So, Father in heaven, we ask, help us, help us, to understand something about when we're met with your silence. Lord, that that would generate faith and maturity, we pray in your precious name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. So what do we do with God's silence? Well, often the remedy is found, and this is a classic verse. Many have memorized this verse. Songs have been scripted around this verse. Chapter 40, verse 31, Isaiah, East, uh, English Standard. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. So when God is silent... The remedy, wait on the Lord. Wait on. Now, so let's talk about waiting here for a while this morning. I believe this is going to be uplifting, but it's not going to be a rah-rah message. I believe it's going to be a message that will give you some endurance tactics. It's a message that is really building on the things that we shared last week, where last week we talked of the seasons from John chapter 15 of abiding in the vine. We talked of the seasons of the vine, and the seasons of the vine where the summertime is a season of hostility, where there is no blessing exterior. There is no outside blessing. The growth does not take place above the surface. The growth takes place below the surface if you don't mess with it. But if you try messing with it, if you try to change your tactics, you'll kill the whole thing. So what is set in springtime sets the pace for what happens in your summers. When God ministers to you, and sometimes at a conference, a retreat, your personal time with the Lord, it might be Sunday morning, it might be this morning, where God ministers to you in a powerful way, and when he ministers and the word just generates and something stirs in your heart, and there's a worship exploding in your spirit, there's an awakening, and in that, you need to recognize that you need to set that pattern because there will be seasons of difficulty where the roots have to find a new source, not a different source, but a new stream that they will be able to bring forth the fruit God wants in you. Remember, God has something better. And if we got it instantly, if you got your answers today, if you got your answers this week, and sometimes it happens, but frequently, if you got your answer today or this week, then the better won't come. Because the better is on the other side of this silence and waiting on the other side. So what do we do with this waiting then? If you're like me, waiting's a word I don't like. Okay, you can, I want to hear somebody testify to that. If that's you as well, would you lift your hand? Okay, all right. The rest of you, I'm curious. So waiting, I don't like to wait. Laura reminded me this morning, after our sixth stop at a stoplight, she reminded me, honey, you caught every single red light on the way to the church this morning. She doesn't have to tell me that. I am upset because I want to catch the greens, or at least the orange, but I do not want the reds. And it seemed like everything was red on the way. That, and I, I don't really enjoy waiting, waiting for anything particularly. And this has been a season of waiting. 
Has it not? Waiting in line, waiting for things to open, waiting for this and that. Waiting. So my message is entitled, When God is Silent, but I want to put a subtitle, Learning to Wait. Because when God is silent, we need to learn to wait. And here's two observations I begin with. Number one, I don't get to decide when God will speak to me. I don't get to decide when God will speak to me. He's God. I'm not. That's one of the greatest theological statements you can ever learn. He's God, and you're not. So I don't get to determine when God's going to speak to me. He's not at my beck and call. Secondly, I also don't get to decide what God will say to me. He is God. Finish it. And I am not. So I don't decide when, decide when God will speak to me. I don't get to decide what he will speak to me. I have one part to play and one part alone. My part is to wait on the Lord. His part is to speak when he's ready and what he wants to say. My part is to wait. Now, that's worth the price of admission here this morning, all in itself, right there. My part is to wait. His part, he speaks when he's ready and what he wants to say. Let me start by telling you what waiting is not. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? Well, here's what waiting is not. Waiting is not biding my time. Waiting on the Lord is not putting it into neutral in my life and coasting. That's not waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord is not kicking back and hanging out. And waiting on the Lord is not throwing up my hands and saying, oh, whatever. That's not waiting on the Lord. That's not what is referred to here. To wait on the Lord does mean to be in his face. Psalms, or sorry, Luke 18. There's a widow, and she's after justice. And she goes before the judge who represents God. And she gets in his face. I'm not talking in an arrogant way. I'm talking in a way that there is not any other answer but you. Judge, you hold the total verdict. So I don't go looking for something else. I don't distract. I stay in your face. And the persistent widow of Luke 18 is a picture of what waiting is. Waiting is being in his face. Secondly, waiting is to gaze and to stare at him. Psalms 27. David spoke about this one thing I will do. I will gaze into your beauty. I will stare into your face. That's what waiting is. It's before his face and gazing and staring at him. Thirdly, what, what is waiting? Waiting is to press into him with panting and longing. To press into him with panting and longing. Psalms 42, as the deer pants for the water. Deers normally don't pant unless they're wounded. There's a lot of woundedness. As the deer pants in his woundedness for the water, so my soul pants for you, O Lord. You alone. You alone are my heart's desire. That's waiting. That's waiting. And waiting, fourthly, is to be vigilant. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be vigilant because you have an enemy. So you are vigilant in waiting before him because your enemy is all around you. So you stay, in the, you stay in his sphere. You stay in the sphere of him before his face, gazing and staring at him, pressing into him with panting and longing and vigilant and alert. That's waiting. They that wait upon the Lord, only they will renew their strength, waiting on the Lord. Now, there are a number of temptations that are going to try to knock you off your waiting. You're probably going to identify to these three temptations. Temptation number one, the temptation to demand an immediate answer. In the place of waiting on the Lord, you will be tempted to have to provide an answer. And for those who are results-oriented, action-motivated, you're going to be very tempted on this one. Demand an immediate answer. Those who insist on an immediate response, though, do so because they fail to appreciate the profound spiritual work that God does in our lives in the process of waiting. If you demand your answer and you get distracted in the waiting, it's because you fail to understand 
that in the process of the waiting, God is doing something way beyond that would ever happen if you got your answer right away. We go back to Hebrews 11. That's the, that's the story. So the temptation is to demand an immediate answer. The second temptation I see is the temptation to give up. Just to give up. I've waited long enough. And voices of giving up sound like this. See if you can identify. I just marked the ones I hear. Voices like, I think God forgot me. I don't even know if he really cares about what I'm going through right now. Or what about this voice? I'm really too messed up for God to bother with this particular situation. What about this voice? I'm going to do all this waiting only to one day wake up and realize God never intended to answer the prayer all along. That one hits me over and over. I'm going to do all this waiting to one day wake up and realize he wasn't going to do anything about it anyway. What about this temptation, this voice? I didn't do anything to deserve this, God. God, you're doing me wrong. What did I do? Or what about this voice? I've been serving God faithfully, only to what? Get nowhere? It's the temptation to give up, so you quit. It's going to be a temptation as you move into the season of waiting in the time of silence. The temptation is to quit. The third temptation I wrote down was the temptation to just do something. As you wait on the Lord, do something. Circumstances scream for a decisive decision. You're an indecisive person. You're a person tossed to and fro. If you don't, do something. I don't like not doing something. And so the temptation is to just do something. I mean, isn't it one of the commandments? God helps those who help themselves. By the way, if you're wondering, it's not. That's not even in the Bible. God helps those who help themselves? No. Quite to the contrary. He tells you to get your eyes fixed on him and wait on him. Be still and know that I am God in the middle of it. Now keep in his face. Keep reminding him of his goodness. Remind him of the promises. Stay in the face of God. But it's nowhere there God helps those who help themselves. Jesus knows how you feel. He understands this particular one. Just do something. Over and over in Jesus' life, his ministry here on earth, he was pressed you have to do something by people who were demanding a response. Show me signs. Show me your wonders. Dance before me, Jesus. That's what Herod wanted. Dance before me. Show me your tricks. Open up your tickle trunk. Let me see you, oh Jesus, do these wonderful magical works. Do something if you are the Son of God. When Jesus hung on the cross, when he hung on the cross, the leaders the Jewish leaders said, save yourself. Let me see if you can really do it. I don't know, beloved, here this morning, if I was Jesus, if I could have withheld that one. I would have been so tempted to do like you've watched in some of those action movies. Just look up, look down, let fire fly. Right? Aren't you glad I'm not Jesus? <laughs> save yourself, Jesus waited. The soldiers who crucified him, who put the spikes in his hands, said, save yourself, Jesus waited. The audacity and gump of those two on either side, the thieves who were themselves criminals, looked over and said, save yourself. The temptation was do something. Jesus understands. And he didn't. Because something better was coming. You see, if Jesus saved himself, we wouldn't be here today. We would not have the cross. We would not have redemption. My sins would not be forgiven. I would be lost in my sins if Jesus did something that day. No, there was something better coming. And I want to suggest there's something when we understand the temptations to come our way, the temptations to demand an immediate answer, the temptation to give up. Oh, well, I've had it. Or the temptation to just do something. We go back to Hebrews 11:38. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, 
so that only together with us would they be made perfect. If you go back to verse 38, did you note that part? Living in caves and in holes. This is what happened to David. So I want to take the last half of what I'm sharing today to talk about King David because King David becomes a great example. He's cited right there, living in caves. That was the story of King David. He's an example of experiencing unanswered prayers. It was called the Cave of Agilum. The Cave of Agilum. And this is the cave that he literally, in 1 Samuel chapter 22, talks of David running to the Cave of Agilum where he got no answers. Everything that should have been wasn't. He had been wandering for year after year, enduring wilderness times, dryness, barrenness of his soul. I mean, you read the Psalms, many of the Psalms, and we alluded to Psalms 27. We're going to come back to that. I was reading earlier today Psalms 37. I mentioned earlier Psalms 42. When you read through the Psalms, you read through much of the turmoil of waiting. If you can put those glasses on and read the Psalms again, realizing God is preparing you for something better in that season of waiting. And so here David was in the season in desperation. We can take a look at, I mean, this is the young guy who killed the giant. This is the guy who was a proven warrior at a young age. This was the guy who sang songs and wrote hymns. He was the guy who was the master musician, a skilled artist. He was the guy who, who was the psalmist who led worship, who, who beckoned and entertained the presence of God. This is the same guy. And yet here he is running for his life. God had spoken to him and raised him up and called him to be the next king. And then year after year after year after year, for over 10 years, David's running for his life and hiding out in caves. The cave of Agilum. They call it the cave of Agilum. We pick it up, 1 Samuel 22. Talks of these painful, silent years. The cave of Agilum was a literal place. And it was during these hiding years in this cave where David actually wrote most of the Psalms. So when you read the Psalms and you begin, when it says the Psalm of David, and then you read most of the Psalms, realizing a lot of them were written from the cave. Mm, it enriches you for your experience. Often we think of King David writing them from the palace. Uh -uh. He wrote it from the cave of Agilum. Not all of them, but a number of them, the scholars believe, came from the cave of Agilum. Three things I want to draw out here that happened in David's life. Because these three things I identify, you can identify these three things. Number one, David entered into a season of depression. A season of depression. When God began to squeeze David, David would be given to depression. 1 Samuel 22, verse 1. David left Goth and escaped to the cave of Agilum. When his brother's sister's father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. Now note this, verse 2. All those who were in distress, in debt, discontented, gathered there, and he became their commander. About 400 were with him. Note that phrase, all those who were in distress. It was a cave full of, 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 of distressed people, of people who were depressed. God determined that nothing would go David's way, and so nothing went his way. And since God knew David inside and out, God knew exactly what it would take to press David into the lowest regions of depression. He just brought a pile of depressed people just like David all around him. And they kind of sang their songs of sorrow together. It was a sad time in their lives. David's depression. Secondly, you see in the cave of Agilum, you will enter into David's loneliness. Yeah, there was 400 men that first joined David in the cave of Agilum. The ranks would grow at their peak up to 600. But they were not as loyal as they appear. This crowd was a crowd that frequently cried mutiny. Frequently, they wanted David's head. They were a really messed up bunch. I had an 80-some-year-old woman who was a part of my prayer shield. She was the pastor's wife of the pastor who founded the church I was in. Godly woman. Look up to her. She passed away a number of years ago. And she would, when we would get together, as a group of people to pray, 
And Lori and I had entered into this time where they would pray for our family. We would get together. She called us the Motley Crew. So I looked it up. What's a Motley Crew? It's not a crew that get, you know, it's a crew that's just got to throw together. And she called us the Motley Crew. But boy, could they shake heaven and earth. We were a motley crew, and David was surrounded with a motley crew. These were a really disturbed bunch of guys. Just their definition, distress, debt, and discontent. I mean, they, they were just not, they weren't the one your mom wants you to date. Put it that way. And uh, David felt alone. You can be alone in a crowd, can't you? He was surrounded, but he was very alone because God had given him a promise, and this is all he had to work with. And Psalms 27, again, to have been believed, to have been written during this time. Psalms 27. And if you can just go flip over to Psalms 27 for a minute. I, I was just going to read one verse here today, but I thought we, we won't understand verse 14 if we don't understand the first and the end. Psalm 27. It starts off, David saying, from the cave, they believe again from the cave of Agilom, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? He's trying to encourage himself. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? What does that mean? David's struggling with fear. Verse 2, when wickedness advances against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. He's speaking to himself. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing. I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Remember, waiting is to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his, his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above my enemies who surround me at his sacred tent. I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. You hear this anguish in David here. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me. Do not forsake me. God, my Savior, though my father and mother forsake me. Uh oh, do you see that? Though my father and mother forsake me, Lord, you'll receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. Then he's encouraging himself again. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Verse 14, here it is. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart. Wait for the Lord. Wow, we had to read that whole psalm, I think. We had to read all that. Do you see and feel the anguish of this guy? This guy in his loneliness. David's depression, David's loneliness, and he was on a ministry hiatus. David knew he was called of God. It was a very dramatic calling when Samuel anointed him with oil. It was evident in the early days of David's music and worship. He fought the bear, he fought the lion, and won. He fought Goliath and won. And all of his abilities, boom, just as fast as it came, it seemed to go. Totally removed. David removed from the king's presence. As a matter of fact, the king hated him. The very king he saved the life of, now David is running from. The king wants to take his life. Talk about death of a vision. David's vision had vanished. It seemed like heaven and earth were against him, and he had no idea why. You see, there is purpose when God is silent. There is purpose when I'm in my wilderness. There's purpose in the wilderness. I used to believe God's silence was actually growing faith in me. I don't believe that so much anymore. Because when I look at the story of David, God did not take David into the wilderness for 10 years to make him a man of faith. David was already a man of faith before he went into the wilderness. No, the wilderness 
prepared David for more than a man of faith. The wilderness prepared David to be more than the man who would be the heir to the throne. The wilderness was all about preparing David for something eternal. You see, to this day, the city of David is still called the city of David, Jerusalem. To this day, David is constantly being looked to as an example of faith. David needed more than just faith to get through these moments. David needed to go through the wilderness in order to have something eternal. Remember, we go back to Hebrews. He is doing something greater than what appears. David would have been a good king, but he needed to be the best that God had for him. And he could not be the best unless he was completely broken and remade. Wow, there it is. Unless there's complete brokenness and a remaking of you and I, then the fullness of what God wants to complete in us can't be completed. We have called this month and next month and the month after, and maybe the month after, we've been calling it, now is the time. Now's the time to pray. Now's the time to get in God's face. Now's the time to fast and to seek his face. So I encourage, you know, cutting back on, on devices, cutting back on games, cutting back on television, cutting back on things that maybe have been a distraction, not necessarily evil of themselves, but we are repositioning ourselves and we're opening up the scriptures and we're getting in the face of God. We're reading these scriptures over and over again, meditating on them, taking out a scribbler and writing what's coming to our mind and our hearts, meditating, seeking his face taking times to fast, miss a meal. And in that 30 minutes, we go and we pray and we talk to him. We lay our hearts bare to him. We spend time in his presence, picking up some Christian curriculum and beginning to read stuff that will inspire us from other godly writers, of listening to godly music and going back and letting the words get into your spirit and into your heart, picking up your instrument again and beginning to worship God in your instrument. But whatever that place is, we've called this a season to get back into the face of God. Because God will speak. He will speak. And when God is silent, it's not that he is desiring to snub you. His silence is because he is desiring to grow something in the season of our waiting. Our waiting is not passive. Our waiting is aggressive. We wait in the face of Lord. We wait in his face. We seek your face, O oh God. We seek his face. We seek his face. We seek his face. David and his son Solomon probably can maybe best illustrate a person who has been broken by God, David, and what that did for David. His son Solomon, who was very similar in all of David's past. Solomon, David grew up, you know, in the fields. His dad was godly. Uh, so, you know, he had some of the benefits. He had some of the privileges. Uh, he was young. He was called of God when he was young. Uh, he saw some great wins when he was young. So did Solomon. Solomon grew up in the king's court. He had blessings. He had the favor of a family, a godly family. He was around the presence of the Lord. Solomon saw some great things happen in his life. He made that great declaration. Instead of being a man of, of material things, he sought the wisdom of the Lord. You know, some, some great things that were happening in Solomon's life. Two parallels, a father, a son. Two parallels. But David remained true. Solomon pulled away. Solomon took a turn partway through his life. You read of it in the book of Ecclesiastes. You read of the wanderings of Solomon later in life. So they started off on this plateau, this, this place, this pursuit, but one remained true. David remains true. Solomon pulls off. What's the difference between David and Solomon? I'll tell you the difference. Solomon had no cave of Agilent. Is it not true? Solomon had no cave of Agilent. He knew no counterpart of David's years of wanderings. You see, it was in David's wanderings God made him. Solomon never had it. He got immediate answers. And so later in life, he pulled away. Immediate answers is not the answer to our problems. Waiting on the Lord. Seeking his face. God does answer. But when we seek him with all our heart, we will find him. But the seeking can be a long season of seeking. Solomon's lack of suffering became his downfall. And as a consequence, 
he fell prey to materialism. There's a scriptural principle, and it is this. We cannot handle the glory unless we have first handled the pain. When I can handle the pain, read of Paul, the apostle, when I can handle the pain and the sufferings and joy in that and find him at a deeper level, a level below the surface, then he can entrust me with the glory of something greater when it doesn't make any sense. So it comes down to you and I this morning. In God's silence, possibly he is desiring to take you through the cave experience, not to harm you, but that you might find him. Mom, dad's here today. The worst thing that can happen to your children is not that they face trials and temptations, but that we do not allow them to experience their caves within God's purpose. You see, mom and dad's, our instinctive tendency is to helicopter, whoop, 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 and rescue them and steer them clear of their pain. That's not the worst thing that can happen to them is the pain of God's silence and the seasons of waiting. Help them to drop their roots and to find God at a deeper level. Discover him at that level, not the superficial level, the deeper level, and they will experience the God of their salvation. I believe verse 18 to 20 of Ecclesiastes 2 records Solomon's greatest error. Can I just, let's read that. I think we have it up in PowerPoint. Let's read it. Um, Ecclesiastes 2, 18. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun, but I must leave them to the one who comes after me. This is Solomon. I hated all the things that toiled under the sun because, because why did he hate? I have to leave them to someone else. 19, and who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish, yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toils and labor under the sun. I firmly believe Solomon's greatest request when he asked for wisdom of the Lord, there was actually a better one. It's what David sought. David's request according to Psalm 27 was that he would see the face of God. Solomon became so enamored with things that the thought of leaving them to someone else destroyed him. David, things just slipped out of his hands because they meant nothing. Because David's eyes were fixed on something eternal. And in that, nations were saved. Solomon mistook God's silence on matters that didn't make natural sense to turn his heart away from God. I believe God can handle your despair. He can handle your despair, but he cannot help you if you turn your heart away from him. So beloved this morning, don't turn your heart away. Turn your heart back in. Reposition back into the face of God. Whatever I do today, whatever I God do tomorrow, whatever I do this week, and this Wednesday night, I'm going to just take this a few steps farther on Wednesday night. I'm going to actually take you to five scriptures on how to interpret God's silence. Scriptures that talk about it, because he's not quiet when he's silent. He's actually speaking in his silence. And there's going to be, we're going to look at the silence of God's judgment, the silence of his mercy, the silence of his testing, the silence of his waiting, and the silence of his love. So we close with this great text, 2 Chronicles 7. If my people who are called by my name, note the first thing, if my people called by my name will humble themselves, the caves of Agilom, and pray, and seek my face, get into his face, turn from their wicked ways, because when that happens, God will begin to shine the light in your life, and you'll see things going on in your life. Turn from wicked ways. Then, then, God says, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sins and heal your land. I'm going to invite the worship team to come at this time. There's a song we're going to sing. If faith can move the mountains, let the mountains move. We come with expectation, waiting here for you. I'm waiting here for you. You're the Lord of all creation and still you know my heart. The author of salvation, you've loved us from the start. 
We're waiting here for you with our hands lifted high in praise. And it's you we adore singing hallelujah. The last verse, you are everything you've promised. Your faithfulness is true. We're desperate for your presence. All we need is you. 